Thank you. All right. So yeah, we're excited to be presenting about our work on classification models for statistical graphics. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it to Sam, who will kick it off. Yeah, so starting off with a little bit of an introduction, sort of the motivation behind the project. And it all sort of stems from a very simple question. How do we determine linearity? Um, there are two main like introductory base level methods for determining whether or not a graph is linear. And those are one, visual inspection. Does the graph look linear? And two, the correlation or an R value for how well a line fits the data. And so if we look at these two graphs, we've got graph A and graph B. We can see that graph A most likely comes from a sort of random spread around some sort of linear data, whereas graph B has a really low variance around a quadratic form of some equation. And so what we say is when we look at this with our, with our visual inspection, graph A looks more linear than graph B. Um, the problem arises when we use the sort of more numerical approach of, okay, like what is the correlation of these two? How well do these fit an actual line? And we get that both of these two values from the ANSCOM data set have 0 0.816 correlation or R value. And there are two other graphs in this data set that have similar, similar um, conclusions. And so this raises uh, a handful of questions that we tried to answer throughout uh, our research, which was, since R doesn't tell the whole story, can we come up with an interpretable method to assess the linearity of graphs? Can we apply those same techniques to different types of graphs? And could we use a, a tool that, that works like that to actually interpret residual plots or other types of graphs that aren't just whether or not a graph is linear. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Uh, so we did some prior literature review and we found that in 2005, there was a paper that introduced this idea of skagnostics, which are basically scatterplot diagnostics. And so I'm gonna walk through a little bit about what skagnostics are and how we use them in our own research. Uh, so you can go to the next slide, Sam. As you can see on the left side, there's a list of five different categories of skagnostics, which all kind of aim to measure different parts of statistical graphics. We show an example of shape, uh, which is there's four different types of skagnostics that try to um, describe what the shape of a graph is. Um, and so specifically, we're going to look at convexity. Um, if you go to the next slide, we have an example graph here, which is the iris data set, a very classic graph using statistical analysis. Um, and the, the way that we measure convexity in this graph is we take the area of the alcohol, which is outlined in blue on the graph, and we take the area of the convex hull, which is outlined in red. And then we divide those two to get some value between zero and one. Uh, the values closer to one means that it's more convex. The value closer to zero means that it's less convex. And so basically all of these diagnostics uh, are measurements between zero and one. And if you go to the next slide, Sam, we have a quick illustration of um, how we determine, you know, how close convexity is between zero and one. So if the area of the alpha hull is lower, if, if it's much smaller than the area of the convex hull, we get a measurement closer to zero. But as you keep on increasing the area of the alpha hull, you get a measurement closer to one. And so this is just one example of a diagnostic. There's 12 different diagnostics in total. Um, but I'm going to pass it off to Elijah, who will talk. Actually, one, we have one more slide before that. Um, so this is just a quick demonstration of how we use the diagnostics in our uh, model. So here's a scatter plot that we have. Um, we get the diagnostics from that scatter plot, and we have a bunch of these different diagnostics as uh, values between zero and one. We use that as input to our model, and then our model, our trained model, spits out some uh, measure of how linear uh, it believes the scatter plot is. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Elijah, who will talk about the results. Yeah. Um, so as, as Tegan mentioned, um, we wanted to use these diagnostics as predictors in a series of classification models and then compare their performance um, um, to see how well each could, could identify plots as linear or nonlinear. Uh, so we used three different uh, classification models a random forest uh, that we tuned um, using uh, cross-validation, uh, a logistic regression model, and then a generalized additive model, or a GAN. Uh, after we had selected our three models, uh, we generated our, our training and testing data. Um, so our first sort of, for our first uh, pass through our analysis, um, we generated nine different types of plots um, shown here. 
um, we generated uh, randomly generated different um, different iterations of each of these plots. Um, and then we once we had a big set of these plots, we split into training and testing. Um, and uh, in our next slide, uh, we can see that um, when we when we um, looked at the performance of these these three models across this these um, th this training data, um, we saw really, really high accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity across all three models. Um, so the GAM model was the highest, random forest was just behind, and then logistic also had, you know, uh, metrics above 97%. Uh, so to go a step further though, we wanted to see how well our models could perform if we introduced um, distributions that we didn't train these models on. So we added uh, these six distributions, um, and we essentially just wanted to see if 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 these models could perform well, um, even if they hadn't been trained on these on these distributions. So as you might guess, we saw pretty significant uh, uh, dips in in accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. Um, so double digit drops in accuracy across all three models, and then pretty substantial drops um, in those other two metrics as well. Um, so to look at this further, we we kind of broke down accuracy by plot type for each of our three models. So we wanted to see what the problematic distributions were, what, what, what distributions our models were struggling with. So out of those first nine distributions um, for the logistic regression model, we saw that logarithmic growth um, was, was the lowest accuracy. And then when we moved on to the, the six additional distributions, we saw that absolute value, linear near zero slope, and rotated sign distributions were the most problematic. Uh, if we go on to GAM, we can see that um, uh, the, the, the train distributions were good across the board, but then when we added those additional testing distributions, we saw the same three plots causing problems. And then it was a similar story for the random forest model. Um, those same, same three plots um, show the lowest accuracies. So in summary, we can see that um, we had these three problematic distributions, absolute value, linear, near linear near zero slope and rotated sign. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to T and who's gonna talk about how we how we dove further into this. Yeah, thanks Elijah. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the rotated sign distribution specifically. And here's just a quick review of the accuracy numbers that each of the three models presented on the rotated sign. They're all pretty low because it wasn't trained on the rotated sign. You can click next to him. Um, so the big questions that we wanna answer is, why did the models perform so poorly on rotated sign and the other two problematic distributions? Can we improve it by adding more to the training data set? And is computer vision actually a more suitable approach to this uh, problem? And so we conducted a new experiment where we generated all the uh, original training distributions along with the um, additional testing distributions. Um, you can go to the next slide. And then we got this diagnostics for all of our uh, generated distributions, split it into training and testing, and then basically tested our models on them. So now we're including the additional testing distributions in the training set, and we're gonna see how well our models perform. We see in the rotated sign, a very significant increase in the random forest and the GAM accuracies, logistic regression, a small increase, not nearly as high as the GAM or the random forest, um, but this is very promising for the random forest and the GAM. And then if we look at a original distribution, the linear, distribution, we see that there is a very small drop in accuracy, but nothing too concerning. So overall, we are very happy with um, how the results are after adding these new distributions to the training data set. Um, yeah, I'll pass it off to Sam, who will talk about the residual setting. Yeah, so just really quick, I want to go back to what I sort of said at the top of this presentation about how maybe these techniques could be used for something that isn't just a linear graph. For example, residual plots. And what we found is that in a similar way, as we sort of visually inspect, we can use the techniques that we um, developed to uh, test whether or not a residual set or a residual plot actually is a good fit for data, whether or not the residual plot is random and a linear model is uh, accurate for whatever model the residuals are reflecting. Um, we actually find that um, even before we add the additional training distribution or additional testing distributions into the training set, that we actually are more accurately able to determine whether or not a residual plot is a good fit um, when compared to whether or not a, a um, linear plot is, or a plot is linear or not linear. Um, so finally, in summary, as we add more data and features, we, we um, find that we get more accurate results. 
but also that those results become harder to interpret. Um, we believe there's a good balance to use our skegnostics with a random forest model, although that random forest model, while increasing accuracy, does restrict our ability to interpret our results. And while you may be thinking throughout this presentation, why not use a convolutional neural net? If you read the paper, we have some sort of exploration of those topics, and we find that while they um, do have the ability to potentially be more accurate, they also lose the sort of interpretability that these uh, calculatable skegnostics uh, consist of. And finally, there are promising applications in at least the residual space in the sort of uh, modeling and and, um, and research that we've done. Uh, here are some acknowledgments uh, for our advisor, uh, technical support, and the Carlton Stats Department as a whole. Uh, thank you for, for listening. Uh, I think that's all we've got.